all the the spices we like and the the ginger and the, the turmeric and all these good we think all these spices are so good for us and they're actually like especially turmeric is like the highest on the ox oxalate spectrum mm -hmm. and that's like what causes most people a lot of inflammation and there's like lectins polyphenols anti-nutrients like there's just thousands and hundreds of thousands of these that are just constantly affecting us on a daily basis and we have no idea so just the concept of plant defense chemicals, like I thought it was crazy at first, but I started looking into it and started hearing him explain all that. And it did make so much sense. It's just like these, these anti-nutrients inside these things, these defense mechanisms, when our saliva comes in contact with them, the plant defends itself. It is literally trying to kill you. It does not want to be eaten. So it tries to kill yeah. you any way it can and destroy your gut, destroy your gut lining so that you will not eat it anymore. Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. All right. Okay. Um, we'll kick it off. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's Dr. Uh, Anthony Chafee again here with um, uh, another podcast today. I have a guest, uh, Tyler, who has been carnivore for over three years now and has uh, been looking into all the different uh, ways that this helps uh, health and lifestyle and uh, spoken to many other uh, other experts in the field, such as Dr. Kiltz and Jamie Seaman. And uh, I was a, a follower of uh, Dr. Saladino for a very long time and uh, who helped him get on his way uh, to his current state. So uh, Tyler, nice to meet you and uh, thanks for coming on. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, not at all. So. Um, why don't you give us a, just a brief uh, background uh, on yourself and uh, how you came about all this? Yeah. So um, my family, when I was a child, we kind of ate a typical standard American diet-ish. And then as I got older, probably like kindergarten, first, third, second, third grade, then we started to kind of care a little bit more about our health. Um, we started getting into more of a whole foods diet. Um, and then started really getting heavy into like herb plant supplementation. And ever since, I mean, as long as I can remember, I have always had brain fog issues. I've always had like ADD issues, couldn't sit still, couldn't pay attention correctly. Um, and just kind of nervous system issues. I just had really high highs, really low lows. It was never consistent. Um, and I just could never quite figure it out. My parents could quite never figure it out. Um, during school, this was through middle school, uh, high school, even college. Um, I really pissed a lot of teachers off because I couldn't sit still because I couldn't pay attention. Um, and in middle school, my teachers did want to put me on Ridlin or something like that to control me. Um, and my parents were not okay with that. So we started diving a lot deeper into nutrition and the herb supplementation, and everything thinking that would help. Um, but I just had such low self-esteem myself being told at such a young age, like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you pay attention? Why can't you comprehend any of this information we're teaching you? Why do you need so much extra help? So I just felt really stupid for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I felt stupid ever since I was a little kid, all the way up until I was about 27, 28 years old, until I really, really started figuring out correct nutrition, actual correct nutrition. Um, so my life was just a battle of just kind of disappointment, hitting myself, thinking like, I'm never going to be good enough to kind of go to college, get a good degree in what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an engineer for a while. Um, and I just thought like, man, I can't pay attention in class. I can't comprehend any of the information. How am I going to become an engineer? Because all the math courses you got to take. So I kind of left that dream behind. Um, I tried becoming a firefighter, a police officer. I tried starting my own landscape company. Um, ever since I can remember about, about 13 or so um, on and off, um, I was working in the family business and fence construction. So we build fences and I just came to the realization, like, I think I'm just, I'm meant to do physical labor. That's all I'm good for. I can't remember shit. I can't think clearly. I'm just, I'm just good for physical labor. I'm just a physical person. That's all I'll ever be. So I thought those thoughts about myself my entire life. And I accepted that. Um, and I was also very skinny. I always wanted to kind of become a bigger guy, bigger bodybuilding guy. And I tried everything I could. I tried eating a crazy caloric surplus diet, um, multiple large meals a day. Um, there was points where I would even, I would have like six large meals a day and then I would eat between those meals, have like nuts and stuff, just always constantly pounding, pounding calories. Cause that's what the bodybuilding industry kind of told you to do. You got to eat that often. You just got to pound all these calories about proteins or caloric surplus. And I did all that. 
And I tried to take care of that insecurity of being skinny um, through all that time. And even I had the nervous system issues. I had gut issues. I'm not kidding. I had gas my entire life. I had gas probably every five, 10 minutes. There was probably not a time I wasn't gassing. I wasn't constantly farting. Um, and my gut was always kind of in pain. It was bloating. It just didn't feel good. The constipation pains constantly. Um, the most severe brain fog. I couldn't hold a thought to save my life. Like anything I would, I would listen to someone talking to me and it would just go in one ear and out the other. I would watch a movie and I have no idea what the heck I just watched. Listen to podcasts. I have no idea. So life was very frustrating for me. And I just accepted that person that I was. And I was just this way for a long time. I kept doing the bodybuilding diet for the longest time, trying to get bigger. And I did get quite a bit bigger. I gained quite a bit of size, but my gut got worse. My nervous system got worse. My brain fog got even worse. Um, and it just got to the point where it's like, this isn't worth it. This isn't worth eating this way and eating this much calories to get bigger. Um, and I just kind of came to a point where like, what, what is wrong with me? Like, what is healthy eating? Is, is whole foods eating not healthy? Because I was eating everything organic, well-sourced for everything. Um, didn't eat any processed foods, limited sugar intake. Like I thought I was eating as good as you could possibly eat. And every, every kind of doctor I saw, every nutritionist, it pointed to kind of a Mediterranean whole foods diet. That was the best way to go about it. And so I did that for the longest time. Um, but yeah, none of my issues cleared up. I actually... Eventually on a job, my dad and I were working a job in, in uh, Nevada City, California, and I was getting ready for the job. I was setting up all the equipment, um, getting the job ready to all lined out. And um, a man, the customer came out to me and he saw this little healthy tea I was drinking. And he asked like, uh, what, is, what are you drinking? What is that? And I told him it was just like health tea, um, helps with hydration. And he's like, oh, cool. So you like, it seems like you're really into health and it looks like you're really fit. You're into fitness as well. That's awesome. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I work out like uh, six days a week, really into it. Um, and he said, uh, have you ever heard of um, uh, John Jaquish? And he's like, that's my son. And um, I was like, no, I'm, I'm, who is he? And he's like, go and Google him real quick. And I Googled the guy and just this like super successful guy, looked like a multimillionaire, like selling X3 bar, this new workout system equipment. Um, ran Osteo strong and developed that uh, bone density building equipment. And I was just like, man, this guy seems like a big deal. This is awesome. And he's like, he's actually coming here in a couple of weeks if you want to meet him. Um, so I was like, heck yeah, I'd love to meet him. So my wife and I at the time, two weeks later, we went over to his house and um, we sat in the back patio and he broke out the X3 and he was showing the X3 to me. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Like I was, I was open to kind of learning a different way of working out. Cause I'd been a weightlifter for about 10 years up to that point. And my joints, like my stomach didn't feel good from what I was eating. My, like I said, my, my nervous system, my brain, um, my, my body started kind of breaking down all my joints, like my elbows and my knees, my low back, it just kept getting worse and worse, all the inflammation and lifting those heavy weights. And I was at a point where I was open to changing up my diet. And I was also open to trying to find a different way of, of working out. And he showed me this and I thought it was the best thing ever. Like this makes so much sense. Variable resistance. You're lifting lighter in the weakest range of motion where you're more susceptible to injury. And then as you go through the movement, you kind of push the band out more and you have the strong range of motion. You're getting more reps in that strongest range of motion where you're seven times stronger than your weakest range of motion. And this is how you, you grow more. This is how you grow muscle more. It's the correct stimulus for growth. And you're going to burn body fat quicker and gain muscle faster. And I was just like, the science, it all made so much sense. And I, I was just hooked. So he had me try it out and I tried it. And the first thing I did was the deadlift and the amount of muscle isolation I felt and no pain in my joints. It was amazing. I, I was, I was convinced. And he starts going into the best thing to pair with this is the carnivore diet. Yes. And I said, no way. Like carnivore diet, you mean like <laughs> just eat meat? I've heard about this before on the Joe Rogan podcast when he was talking to Jordan Peterson and he was saying he was carnivore. And I was like, that's insane. You literally just eat meat. That can't be good for you. He's like, yeah, man, like that, this is the way I've been doing it for, I think he had been doing it for at least six, maybe eight years at that point. And he said it really, really helped him out. And he's been gaining muscle faster than he's ever had in his entire life with the carnivore diet and X3 combined. Yeah. Um, and I just, man, that you're crazy, but I, I guess I'm going to look into this. And so I, I, he sent me an X3 about a week or so later, I started doing the X3 goes hooked on that. And then I started researching the crap out of the carnivore diet. So um, I would, while I was working with my dad building fences, I would just listen to podcasts like eight hours a day. I couldn't get enough of it. I was listening to Dr. Paul Saladino, Dr. Jamie Seaman, Dr. Sean Baker. And that's when I heard about you as well. And I started listening to a little bit of your stuff as well. 
And I was just like, my God, this makes so much sense. Like this might be able to heal all my issues. Like getting back to eating like our ancestors used to eat as hunters and gatherers. This, this has to be the way it makes so much sense. Just getting rid of processed foods and fast foods, vegetable and seed oils and plant there's plant toxins. That's a thing. And I was just like, what? Like I didn't had no idea. Like how could something that comes from the earth be bad for us? Like it's natural. <laughs> it comes from the earth. Like how is it bad for us to eat it? And I, I just started learning all about that. And it made so much sense. And I started doing the carnivore diet after I was convinced after researching it. And I listened to exactly how Paul Saladino said to construct a carnivore diet at the time that he wasn't including fruits and everything. And it was quick. It was within like a month that my brain fog started lifting. My joint issues started going away. My gut felt better than it ever had in my entire life. But I did have the runs just kind of moving into the carnivore kind of lifestyle. And within I brought two, two months or so, two to three months, I literally had no brain fog anymore at all. No more gut issues, no more joint issues whatsoever. I felt like a new person and being this new person, it freaked me out because I've never known a day of having a clear brain. And I just felt like the possibilities were endless. Like I could do more than just being a fence, uh, fencing contractor. Like there, there's so much more out in the world for me. Like I don't have to just be just settle for, I'm just going to be a physical laborer for the rest of my life. And I started thinking like, man, carnivore diet X three bar, I can train people on this. And <laughs> that's what I did. So I, I learned how to become an online coach. I started training people on it and I loved it. And within, I think it was about hmm, two, three, four months, I started becoming an online personal trainer with those things full time. Um, but then unfortunately I went through a divorce with my wife because I realized like she wasn't the right person for me. The, some of the friends I had in my life, they weren't the right people for me because I could think clearly for the first time in my life. And I was starting to take out things in my life that didn't serve me. Um, and it, it was crazy. So I got, I got divorced. Um, I, I went through that for a while and that really messed me up and all the insecurities I had about myself. Um, everything was just coming to light because I could actually, I could actually think clearly. And I actually did go through a severe depression for a whole year because my life changed so drastically and because I got divorced. So I actually uh, went back into fence construction for another year. And then I came out of that and all the insecurities just coming up. Like you can't, you're not good enough to have another career. You're not good enough to do this or do that every single morning. And then I started saying, I am good enough. I can do this. And so I started giving myself positive affirmation every single day. And I said, I'm going to try this again. I'm going to become a coach again. And so I then gave my dad two weeks eventually. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and pursue the online career again. And I did. And ever since then, I've been an online coach. But it's just insane how just a little thing, just changing what you eat, how much it can truly change your life. That's the only thing that was missing in my life to make it better was just the food that I put in my mouth. And I can't stress enough how huge that is, how so many people out there struggle when they don't struggle unnecessarily when they don't need to. It's literally all about what you put in your mouth. So yeah. that is how my life changed from the carnivore diet. Well, that's awesome, man. I, I mean, it's, it's huge. I, that's a, it's a, you know, very lucky you ran into Jake, which is dad like that. That's awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a well, freaking coincidence yeah. and luck. And uh, I, I always kind of thought like maybe I'd run into somebody eventually that would teach me something new. I didn't know that would mm -hmm. introduce me to a new career. And it eventually it did happen. And it was, yeah. it was crazy when it did. Yeah. That's awesome. So doing for three years now and, um, and how long that you have you been doing coaching? Is it like sort of two years now? I've been doing coaching about three years as well on and off. I've been doing it full time, um, like a year and a couple months now. So not, not too long. Yeah. And what are, what are some of the results you're getting with your clients? Oh, it's amazing. I can, I can always guarantee if someone follows the program, they can lose an average of 30 pounds every 12 weeks. I've had some people wow. lose uh, like 40 pounds in a month and a half before. Um, I've had like 50 to 60 pounds loss for some people in about six months. It's, it's just fast. It makes my job so easy. I get them on a correct carnivore diet and their body just figures it out. Of course, there's the adjustment period, but they start losing the water weight so quickly. 
Um, and the body fat, the body just starts eating away at the body fat, living off it as fuel. It's just so efficient. It's so easy. And I just don't understand how more people, more coaches aren't, aren't doing the carnivore diet for people. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, the Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product, not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well and the more we support meat only products the more meat only products that will be available in the mainstream so if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind check it out using my discount code anthony to get 10 percent off which also applies to subscriptions giving you 25 percent off total all right thanks guys yeah well it's, it's hopefully something that, that more people will get on uh as well and and um you know talking to like vinnie uh, tortorich who did the movies uh you know fatted documentary and, and beyond impossible looking at all the food industry and all the garbage that they put out, you know, he was one of these, um, you know, uh, celebrity trainers, you know, back in like the eighties and nineties and things like that. And he was saying, there was just like, there was like, a, it was a few trainers in Hollywood that like they had the secret. And if you wanted to, if you were an actor and you wanted to get, you know, jacked for a role, you would go to these guys and they put you on a program and you just get, you just get shredded and they were all just doing keto, but they couldn't call it keto because that was, that would that people freaked out uh, by the by the terminology, and so uh, they just sort of, you know, just said just do this. They didn't give it an actual name, and uh, but that's that's really what they were doing. And um, uh, but now obviously that that's you know keto. People know more about keto. People are becoming more familiar with carnivore. So it's it's less of a secret. You don't have to have like a, a celebrity trainer or something like that. This is something that more and more trainers are, are hopefully getting on board with. And, um, and we'll just get more and more prevalent as well, because you're right. It's, it's so easy. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're eating intuitively and your body just makes dramatic changes. And, uh, and it just, it just helps with your workouts as well, because you just get such better workouts and you recover so much from them that it's, uh, it's almost like cheating. I talked, I talked to people yeah. that, um, oops, that was unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> things falling down around me um uh when i was sort of first doing this and, and people were talking about, well you know can you really get you know good results and this and the other i'm like listen like I've, I've gotten better results doing this than you know anything of you know any i've never taken anything except over-the-counter supplements and things like that but like um anything i've ever taken you know I've, I've never had any better results than this and I've, I've worked out with um you know and trained with and played you know professional sports with people who were absolutely on steroids and, uh, and, you know, knowingly like, you know, something that this was not a, a secret among the team and they uh, did not get anywhere near the results that I got from just doing a carnivore diet. And they were not as, they did not get the, the, you know, the increase uh, fitness and athleticism that I got. And as the harder I pushed myself, I, my, my, growth athletically was much faster than theirs and they were on steroids i was not on steroids that's crazy my body worked a hell of a lot better than theirs did you know and so and and people that would free people oh that's bullshit you can't and i was like well i can actually you know because like you know i've played professional sports with people professional athletes who were on steroids and and i was i was able to perform outperform them and and uh and uh, my acceleration and my uh, of my development was faster than theirs, even on steroids. So it's a, it's an absolute game changer. Just people don't realize just how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you you got pretty much into this. You said because of like the plant defense chemicals that sort of you know had you uh, you sort of had you sold at that point saying like oh shit you know these things are really there is that uh, like so what 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 sort of um really struck you about all that yeah the plant defense chemicals it was a crazy crazy thing to hear at first because i couldn't understand like how could and this is the way most people logically think like how could anything that naturally comes from the earth um that comes from the ground is grown from the ground how could that be bad for you like it, it's from the earth and we all hear that I mean, animals are, which animals are abused in factory farming for sure, but no one hears the other side of the story, like regenerative agriculture farming mm -hmm. and how they actually treat the animals correctly. Um, and if you do care about the cow's life, you would support more regenerative agriculture. 
Um, and I just started, I, I started having like an argument for people that like, I don't support killing animals. Like, Mm. it's in mistreating animals like no one no one should that's why regenerative agriculture and is is like the good argument for that um and just the way it helps the land puts uh carbon back into the the soil and how much better the animals are treated how much better quality the meat is um and monocrop agriculture just how it's like killing the soil just growing one thing on one big plot of land how it's it's not natural it's not it's not good for the soil it's not good for anything really. And we're, you're actually killing a lot more animal. It gave me an argument basically to defend against uh, vegetarians or vegans who were coming at me about carnivore lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like, they don't understand that just because it's a squirrel, a rodent, bird, insect, it doesn't give you any more right to kill a bunch more of those than it does to kill like a big cow. It's just, we have more of an emotional connection to killing um, a cow. It's, it's more sad. Yeah. So we feel more bad about it. Um, so, it's just people aren't kind of thinking outside the box about that. And sorry, it's a little bit off track, but that just made so much sense to me. And just looking at plants and listening to Dr. Paul Saladino discuss that the different parts of plants, the extra don't want us, don't want to be eaten that really, mm-hmm. really defend against being eaten. I just found that so fascinating. Like, the 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 root the, the roots and the stems and the leaves like that is some of the most dangerous part of the plant that really doesn't want to be eaten and then mm-hmm. things like there's a there's a plant toxicity spectrum there's like the fruits they want to be eaten they want you to eat them and then disperse their seeds so they can multiply so if you think about the plant toxicity spectrum eating if you're going to eat plants eat the ones that want to be multiplied um, that are more bright that are more colorful that um they want to spread their their genes just like we would want to so i started looking at what he was saying on a plant toxicity spectrum that makes so much sense and why would you eat the vegetables that really look like they don't want to be eaten they're more like gross like like a greenish color or they taste really bitter um and that that made so much sense to me looking at the spectrum of it and learning that like all the the spices we like and the the ginger and the the turmeric and all these good we think all these spices are so good for us and they're actually like especially turmeric is like the highest on the oxalate spectrum Mm -hmm. and that's like what causes most people a lot of inflammation there's like lectins polyphenols anti-nutrients like there's just thousands and hundreds of thousands of these um that are just constantly affecting us on a daily basis and we have no idea so just the concept of plant defense chemicals, like I thought it was crazy at first, but I started looking into it and started hearing him explain all that. And it did make so much sense. It's just like these, these anti-nutrients inside these things, these defense mechanisms, when our saliva comes in contact with them, the plant defends itself. It is literally trying to kill you. It does not want to be eaten. So it tries to kill yeah. you any way it can and destroy your gut, destroy your gut lining so that you will not eat it anymore. And most of us just tend to ignore this. Like we get the gas, we get the bloating after eating plant foods and we just think nothing of it. It's just like, just kind of like beans, 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 magic fruit. The more you eat, the more you too. Like that's just that people say it's like a joke to people, but it's actually very <laughs> serious. Like you, it's telling you it doesn't want to be eaten. Mm-hmm. And then I started hearing more about like onions. There's a reason why onions make you cry when you cut them open. Like it's defending itself. It doesn't want to be cut up and it doesn't want to be eaten. There's a reason why garlic make your breast smell. There's a reason why asparagus makes your pee smell. So if you start looking at all these little clues instead of ignoring it like most people, then it's going to start making sense and it's not so outlandish. So the way he was explaining things, it made so much sense to me. And when I started eliminating these foods, I started noticing my gut started feeling better. I didn't have the bloating. I didn't have the gas. I didn't have the pain. I felt like my, my brain fog started lifting finally, especially getting rid of, I eat a lot of white rice, ate a lot of pasta, a lot of oatmeal. And I would always wonder as a kid, like why why is my stomach so upset in the morning? Why am I feeling so nauseous? And why am I feeling more brain fog at certain times of the day? And it was more after I ate, like what's going on there. And it, if I, I wish I had known this back then when I was a kid, I could have saved myself so much freaking um, harm back then. Um, but the answer was literally in all what I was eating. And I took away the grains, especially all the issues went away, took away the grains, took away the, the, giant handfuls of raw spinach i was just eating every single day because i <laughs> thought i needed fiber we're always told like we need this much fiber we need some soluble fiber some insoluble fiber so i would just eat carrots and i would eat like sweet potatoes and raw spinach just pound like just pounded in my mouth to thinking it was good for me and mm-hmm. in reality it was actually harming me so it, i started making those connections when i started hearing this stuff 
and it worked. It, it was, it was as simple as that. So I, I proved it with trying it that plant defense chemicals are a thing and they need to be, they need to be learned about. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. People just do not respect plants as much as, much as they should, you know, and uh, they think that it's just, you know, like you say, it's like, oh, that's silly. That's crazy. But, you know, no one, no one's saying that uh, it's okay to eat hemlock, you know, um, you know, that that's, we've known that that's deadly poisonous for thousands of years. It's what, it's what killed uh, Socrates. Right. So mm-hmm. People understand that plants do have defense chemicals. They understand they do have toxins and that you're lost in the woods and you run out of food. You can't just eat any random plant. You know, most of them will make you very sick or even kill you. They understand that. And you can ask anyone that and be like, okay, well, why wouldn't you do that? Why did, why don't you just go to the park and just collect a bunch of leaves and make a salad out of that? Why do you spend money and go to the grocery store? Why don't you just eat any random plant if we're in the garden of Eden? You know, and, well, you can't just eat those plants. Well, why not? Well, because you'll get sick. What makes you sick? Why would you get sick? Well, they, they're poisonous and then it's like you know yeah no shit and so some people it clicks for them and other people understand that but then have that sort of cognitive dissonance where they just say like oh well those plants are poisonous but these other ones aren't it's like well they may be less harmful to us and we may have some ability to detoxify some things better than others and we do but that doesn't mean that any of them are good for us you know and um you know, and that's the thing too, you know, a cow eats, you know, animals that eat plants, they, they, they eat very, very specific plants. They eat outside of that, they'll get sick. And there's a whole, you know, there's, there's a whole different, um, you know, field in, in uh, large animal um, veterinary medicine, where you have all these diseases and disorders that come from, you know, a, a particular animal eating something that they're not supposed to eat, and they get sick from that, and they have, they have specific names for that. Um, and so we, we know about that in veterinary medicine. We should understand that in, in a human medicine as well, that you eat something wrong, you'll get a specific dis- disease and disorder because it's not a disease. It's, it's a toxicity. You're getting these toxins from these plants and you're getting sick from them. And while a cow eats grass, it eats very particular grass, very specific grasses, right? And they can't eat all grasses. Other grasses will make it very sick, right? Like they can't eat like sorghum grass, things like that will get very sick from that. And so if they're eating their natural food, they'll be fine. They eat outside of that. They're not fine. So let's say that humans are supposed to eat some plants, right? But I think we can all all safely say that even if we were supposed to eat plants, again, it would be like every other animal, very specific plants, okay? And they'd have to be plants that existed that we evolved on, right? So Homo sapiens have been around for 300,000 years. So this would have to be a plant that we were eating 500,000 years before that and evolved into what we are uh, today, right? Because really haven't changed in about 300,000 years. So something we have, we have been eating before this to be adapted to this already. What plant are we eating now that existed 500,000 years ago? What plant are we eating today that existed 50,000 years ago? All of these things have been hybridized and bred to be very different than their original form. So none of the plants that we're eating now even existed 10,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. You know, we don't even have like the heritage like wheat crops and things like that, that like the ancient Egyptians had, you know, and even then, you know, they, ha- we have uh, the stable isotope um, technology. We were looking at what they ate. We were, they, were, they were eating, you know, a bunch of wheat and things like that. They were getting atherosclerosis, not the, the pharaohs, all the people, pharaohs included. So the normal people were getting atherosclerosis. They had pot bellies, they had gynecomastia and their, their statuary actually depicted that men with, with boobs and a gut. And so, you know, this is, uh, this is, this is part and parcel from eating the wrong thing. And so, and even then, you know, we're eating different things now than we were then, you know, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't pass the smell test that we should be eating all the plants that we're eating now or any of the plants that we're eating now, because none of them existed uh, back when we were evolving. So, you know, and that, and that's the thing, you know, there's people just don't, don't respect the plants uh, as much as they should. You know, there was a, there was a great video that's starting to, uh, that I saw and I started sort of putting out there um, and uh, hopefully will be picked up more and more, but it's this uh, uh, professor of botany from Cambridge University. And he talks about all these defense chemicals and, and things that, you know, the plants being the dominant species, like 99% of, of, uh, of uh, life on earth is our plants. And, um, and so they can't be harmless because they can't be defenseless because they're under constant assault by animals and insects. 
So how do they defend themselves? And so he goes through all the different sorts of chemical and physical defenses they have. And some of those being, you know, like they, they make latex and you start chewing on stuff. It, 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 it's like an adhesive and sticks your jaw shut. So when an animal starts eating this leaf, it gets, it'll mouth will get glued shut with a latex and it won't be able to eat its mouth and die of starvation. So it just, it'll physically stop you from eating it. It'll glue your mouth shut and that, that's it. You got one leaf and you're done. And, and then, um, uh, you know, different sorts of chemicals, you know, the most poisonous thing on earth is ricin, which is a lectin protein that is made from castor beans. Mm -hmm. And so you eat that, you know, one, um, microgram per kilogram is enough to kill any animal, you know, is the most toxic substance that we know of. So, you know, and then there's other things we use medicinally, like, you know, digitalis and foxglove, well, you get, you know, 50 micrograms, you know, uh, off on the dose of digitalis and you're going to kill yourself. Right. And so that's in the plant. You're eating that. It's going to, it's going to stop your heart. You know, this, this is, this is designed, uh, to stop animals from eating it. And so the idea that we're in the garden of Eden and these plants want you to eat them, uh, is, is of course silly. I mean, this is, this is a life form that wants to survive and it wants to procreate. It does not want to be eaten or destroyed. And so, you know, understanding that most of these plants will kill you and then thinking, oh, but you should just eat plants and that's the best thing for you. I mean, that's a bit of a stretch <laughs> and, uh, and people just aren't, they just, they're just not respecting plants as well as they should. Mm -hmm. How serious uh, is it exactly? Like when you eat plants, like what is happening inside your gut, your gut lining, like how serious is this when the plants defend themselves, what is it doing to the linings of your gut? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it depends. It depends on, on, on what you're eating, but there are a lot of these lectins that uh, are quite harmful. Sometimes you wouldn't necessarily absorb them, but they can, they can bind to uh, carbohydrate molecules on the surface of your cells and bind to them and damage them and destroy them or destroy that cell. And, uh, and they can cause like leaky gut. So they can, they can break apart the tight, tight junctions between your enterocytes. And so that, that opens up. So now there's like physical gaps between the cells and, that, and, and molecules can, that are below a certain size can fit through there. Bacteria can fit through there. Bacteria are quite small and they can start getting into your, your systemic circulation, which is harmful. And then you start making antibodies towards them. Your body's have to amount a response to these things. And, um, you know, in, in the genetically susceptible, you can actually get a cross reaction with these antibodies and your own body. This is, this is thought to be where autoimmune issues come from. And um, some people thought that, well, maybe you got a, a viral, infection your body mounts a response to that and then it sensitizes to these antibodies towards your own body and then your body starts attacking that because you know the 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 it was thought that the virus was gone at that point so your body can't be still attacking this infection so it must have sensitized itself to your body but that doesn't actually explain the the uh, observed phenomena because when you stop eating you know plants and carbs and sugar and things like that those antibodies start to go down. And so it is more likely that this is something like these lectins and like these bacteria that are getting in through the leaky gut that your body's mounting a response to. And there's just an overflow effect and your antibodies are now attacking your own cells. That's another thing too, is uh, you know, I've, I've taken uh, um, postgraduate level immunology, um, not something that's necessarily taught in, even in medical school. Um, but uh, you know, your immune cells in your bone marrow and your thymus get primed and introduced to all the different sorts of cells and antigens in your body. And if any of these cells react to them, they get killed. So anything released into your system as an immune cell, as a mature immune cell has already been tested against everything in your body and it won't react to them. So it, it was always a bit confusing to me how this could then be sensitized to your own body. I mean, it's you know possible, but it, it was always just a bit like, hmm, that's weird because most of these things, if they reacted at all, if they had the ability to react to, to our, our body or any of your cells, they would, they would just get wiped out. So <clears throat> the idea with antibodies, you can get sensitized to, and you sort of get more and more stronger associations with them based on that. But it, it was always, a it was always a bit like, hmm, that's it. That's interesting. Your body would allow yourself to do that. And now we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, seeing more clearly where if you just remove these things, you remove all the different plants and just go on like just a, a meat and water diet, especially like, you know, grass fed, you know, beef or whatever, 
that these antibodies go down. So we track these in Hashimoto's and, and other sorts of diseases where you can you can measure the amount of um, antibodies, autoantibodies, and they go down. You know, we track these things and the antibodies are just coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down. And eventually your body just stops mounting this immune response. Um, so other things can do, you know, do similar sort of damage. They can directly damage the, your gut lining. Um, and, you know, fiber can even cause damage. Fiber can cause micro abrasions to your gut lining, cause uh, increased mucus secretion, increased inflammatory reaction. Uh, you ask anybody with Crohn's or also with colitis, what, what fiber does to them. It's not, it's not good. And, um, you know, people with, uh, who are undergoing bowel surgery or have an infection like diverticulosis, diverticulitis, diverticulosis, uh, and appendicitis that they're treating, uh, with antibiotics instead of surgery, you know, they get put on a low residue diet. They say, don't eat anything with fiber basically, because you want to rest the bowel. You want to give it a chance to, to recover. So what does that mean? That means that, that the fiber is, is hard work. Or the bowel and you have to rest the bowel. You have to give it, a, you have to give it a break. Okay. So if fiber was really good for your bowel, wouldn't it be good for you then? You know, if it's, if, if it's causing stress to your bowels, if causing stress to your gut, that would be the only reason to, to avoid it during these, these times. And so that, that doesn't make sense to then say, oh, and when this is done, eat a lot of fiber. That, that's, what's really going to help you. Like, well, where, where was this before? You know, so there's a ton of things that, that get into your gut and damage your gut. I think a big one is, is causing the leaky gut and then getting all this stuff in your system. And then you're having systemic reactions to it. Um, but there are plenty of other things that, that happen before that. So you have, uh, you know, oxalates, tannins, uh, phytic acid, all these things that will bind different nutrients irreversibly. We, we don't have the enzymes to break them down. So before they, you, you get a chance to even absorb these things. These can bind to proteins and nutrients and make them completely inaccessible to our bodies. And then the oxalates and tannins and things like that get into our system and they're binding nutrients in your system and then can cause a serious problem as well. You know, you get, you get like a, a calcium oxalate stones in your, in your kidneys. That's not from excess calcium. That's from oxalates binding your calcium and your body not being able to break that down and it turns into a precipitate. Now, that's, not, that's not because you have a problem with calcium. That's because you have a problem with oxalates and you're not supposed to have oxalates. Oxalates are not supposed to really be in your body in any significant degree, unless you're taking just tons and tons and tons of vitamin C, which can then be turned converted into oxalates. Uh, you really shouldn't have mu much oxalates in your body, but you can get them from, from eating these plants and you can get, you know, these hormone disruptors, things that act as uh, estrogens in your body have estrogenic effects, or even testo uh, testosterone effects in your body. But either way, they disrupt your natural balance of testosterone and estrogen, progesterone, and things like that, which causes a problem. Men need estrogen just like women need testosterone. You get those things out of balance, and you can have significant problems. And then other things that that uh, you know disrupt your digestion in so many other ways block protease, you know, like protease inhibitors and things like that. So even if you have bioavailable protein available, like in meat, if you're eating that in a sandwich with wheat or God forbid soy, those all have protease inhibitors. So even this fully bioavailable protein that you get from meat is now uh, limited in, in your digestion because it blocks the enzymes that are breaking it down. So there's, there's a ton of different things that they can do directly to damage your gut lining and impede your uh, absorption of nutrients. And then just by disrupting your body's ability to uh, absorb nutrients and break down uh, protein and fat and, uh, and, and sequestering off, you know, magnesium and calcium and, and proteins by, by irreversibly binding them with these other structures. So there's, there's so many different defenses that, that plants have, um, that professor from Cambridge, you know, said in that short film is called, um, it was on Cambridge university's uh, YouTube channel called Cambridge ideas. And it was called don't eat the plants, right? Just very straight, straightforward. And he said that, you know, uh, plants are the great chemists of the world. And there's, you know, over a million or nearly a million different plant defense chemicals that they use to deter uh, animals and insects and fungus from, from eating them and attacking them. So there's, there's so many of these things. And uh, so he's saying this makes them the dominant species. They, they, they really are. They're the dominant organisms in the world. And he said, that, you know, so what do you do? Maybe, maybe eat some fruit. You can be a fruitarian. 
But, you know, if you want to eat something, you want to eat real food that actually has a full complement of nutrition, doesn't have all these, you know, disgusting chemicals in them, uh, you know, become a carnivore. So this is, this is a, <laughs> a professor of botany, you know, someone who would know more about this than anybody, uh, professor of botany from Cambridge of all places. And, and he's saying, you know, back in 2011, you should become a carnivore, you know, because this stuff is toxic. Um, I did want to say, you know, that on the matter of fruit, a fruit, obviously fruits and berries and things like that, that obviously is something part of the plant that the plant wants to be eaten and, and move the seeds. But most of those evolved with birds, um, birds to eat these berries and eat these seeds and, and, and move the fruit. Um, so it does want something to eat the, the fruit, but not necessarily us, you know? And so there are, you know, still the majority of fruits and berries are actually still toxic to humans. I mean, there's, um, you know, the cassowary bird is a good example of this. They live up in the, you know, tropical regions of Australia and like Papua New Guinea. And I think, and, um, they, they're just frugivores, right? So they only eat fruit and there's about 150 different sort of tropical fruits that they eat. Nothing else eats these fruits and they will kill you dead. Like these things are, are deadly poisonous. And the reason being is because they want the plant wants the cassowary bird to eat them because those seeds germinate in the guts of the cassowary bird. So if that seed doesn't go through the gut of a cassowary bird, it doesn't become a plant. And so if, if you or I eat that and then just toss the seed, it won't, it won't ever become a plant. And so it has to defend that. So it has to make sure that only the cassowary bird is able to eat it or else that, that baby's dead. Right. And, you know, as, as, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know, as Dr. Saladino points out a lot, you know, like, you know, seeds is a plant's baby, you know, and so that's, that's going to have the highest amount of defenses available uh, for that. And that's why most seeds are really, really toxic, but that also is why most fruit is toxic as well. And, you know, even tomatoes, right. You now that's a nightshade and that's, that's something that can be quite, quite toxic as well. The seeds are the worst. So, you know, this is like the original pasta sauces, they would blanch the tomato, put in boiling water, take off the skin because that has a lot of the defense, a lot of the barrier defense chemicals as well. And then they would take out all the seeds and they would just use the pulp and it'd be vine ripened and, and seen by different studies that when you vine ripen tomatoes, more of the solanine and other toxins go out of it. Uh, whereas if you box ripen it, it, it just stays there, right? So it doesn't get, get taken out. And so they vine ripen it and then take away the worst parts of the fruit. So, um, it's still something to consider, you know, sweeter fruits seem to be less toxic, right? Um, because we recognize fructose as it's thought that we recognize fructose as, as, as very, very sweet because it's something that's not as acutely poisonous to us. So anything containing fructose won't like kill us on the spot, won't kill us that day that we know of. And so that's thought to be why fructose is more sweet because we recognize this, Hey, this is safe to eat. I can eat this. I can survive. I can, until I get my, my, you know, next meal. And, um, but, you know, fructose itself is harmful, I think. And I think that's been, you know, clearly demonstrated uh, by the work of Dr. Robert Lustig and others. Um, and, uh, but also it, it's not completely defenseless, right? You know, if it's not, if it's not ripe, if it's not vine ripe and tree ripened, it's going to have more defense chemicals in there. You know, that's why there's a like rock hard and sort of bitter and sour before it's ripe, you know, all different sorts of fruits and like a crab apple, all these sorts of things. And again, all these fruits that we eat too are completely, you know, we've bred these things to be way, way, way more sweet than they were ever before. And so, you know, we're more addicted to the, more addicted to these things because we get an addictive response from, from fructose as well. But, you know, all citrus, for example, have theranocumarins, which are quite toxic. And we have to detoxify these things. And those same enzymes in our liver that detoxify theranocumarins uh, can also detox or also metabolize different medications. So this is why you can't take grapefruit or grapefruit juice uh, with certain medications because they, the same enzymes detoxifying the grapefruit are what's metabolizing those certain medications. So while there's there's less toxins in sweet fruit there's you know not none and fructose itself can cause harm as well but other other fruits not sweet fruits aren't necessarily good for it i mean i, I don't think avocados are 
necessarily that offensive, but uh, there are going to be some defense chemicals in there. And then there are a lot of berries and a lot of fruits that will just kill you too. So it's, um, it's, uh, it really does depend on the fruit as well. Right. And of course there's vitamins and nutrients, like even in fruits, in vegetables. But the, the thing is like, is the risk worth the reward? How much of the nutrients are we getting versus how much is it actually harming our bodies? Yeah. Most people don't understand that risk. Well, well that, but that's the thing. It's like, you, these are living organisms, right? And so they're going to have different nutrients that are good for living organisms. And that's, that's totally true. Uh, but they, you're right. They cherry pick and they just say, Hey, look, it has this vitamin. It has this thing that makes it a superfood. Right? Yep. It has vitamin C in it. Like nothing else has vitamin C in it. It must be a superfood. And so uh, forgetting to mention that it also has a bunch of defense chemicals and toxins and sugar that make it not good for you. And so you have to look at it in the whole picture in the grand scheme of things. Okay. This has these nutrients. Great. What else does it have? Right. How is it protecting those nutrients? right? Because a cow is defending it with its horns and its hooves and its ability to run and smash you, right? And so that's how it defends its nutrients. How's a plant defending its nutrients? By being poisonous and having toxic chemicals in it that, that can harm you. And also they sequester their nutrients. So this is where bioavailability comes in. So different nutrients, vitamins, minerals, proteins, they're bound up in ways, even glucose is bound up in fiber in ways that we cannot break down. No vertebrate animal can break down fiber. It's actually the bacteria in the guts of herbivores that break down the fiber, eat the fiber first, and then secrete fat and protein. And that's what the cow and the gorilla absorb is fat and protein. So we don't have uh, the ability to do that with fiber. So we have to eat the cow to get the fat and protein because that's that's what the animal kingdom runs on is fat and protein. Right. There are filter. Another way of putting that's it. it. Yeah. Yeah. They they have the ability to do that. We don't. It's actually quite difficult to turn plant matter into animal matter, you know, turn plant tissue into human tissue. It's very difficult. And, you know, all the, you know, say all the iron that's in spinach, I'm like, great. It's not, you're not getting it, much of it, you know, because it's bound up in ways that we don't have the enzymes to break down. Why is that? Because we're not designed to eat it. If we're designed to eat it, then we could naturally extract the nutrients. Right. And there's a lot of different sorts of foods that we have to cook and detoxify by other sort of chemical processes, you know, soak them in lye and do all these sorts of things to make the nutrients more bioavailable and to uh, make them less toxic, right? So what does that mean? That means that we're not designed to eat them. Plain and simple, because we do not have the inherent physiological machinery to do all that for it. We have to go through industrial processes to, to extract these nutrients and to make them less toxic. So by definition, we're not supposed to eat these things. You know, WHO has an entire list a page of, of all the different toxins and plants. Uh, and they talk about kidney beans. It, beans are uh, beans are a seed. Seeds are a plant's baby. Everything protects its baby more than anything. And so there's tons and tons and tons of these lectins in, in beans in particular, like castor beans. They have ricin. That is the most deadly poisonous thing on earth. But other, other lectins can cause just as much harm. They can still kill you. Um, on the WHO's website, they even say, that uh, five, as little as five kidney beans has been known to put people in the hospital. And in fact, yeah. And so you have to cook these things, you have to boil them, soak them, do all these things for a certain amount of time. But if you undercook them, they can actually be more toxic than if you just didn't cook them at all. So you have to be careful. So you go al dente on kidney beans, you're in trouble. And so, you know, one person I was talking to said, oh, but you know, but we don't eat, you know, kidney beans raw. So that's, that's a moot point. It's like, no, no. The point is that we should be able to eat kidney beans raw if we're supposed to eat them because we were not cooking things 2 million years ago. You know, we did not know about this. We didn't just evolve knowing how to detoxify plants chemically. We would have had to, you know, what, what our ancestors millions of years ago were eating were what they could eat and extract nutrients from. And the ones that were getting the more uh, nutrient dense foods were the ones that survived, Right. And so those happen to be the ones that were eating meat. And um, so, you know, you, you can't just, just jump into this thing, you know, 5,000 years ago, 200 years ago and say, oh, well, we're eating this now. We're eating this in this way. That's, we're meant to eat that. That's where, no, no. We had to have been eating this 50,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago, a million years ago for us to be adapted to eat it. And if we were doing that, 
we would be adapted to eating it. We would not have to cook it. We would not have to uh, ex- you know, do different chemical processes to extract the nutrients. People say, oh, well, you cook meat. So there goes that theory. You don't have to cook meat. There's plenty of people that don't, the Inuit don't. Uh, and so, you know, you don't have to cook meat to extract the nutrients. In fact, you know, a lot of people talk about how there's a lot of things that are more bioavailable and you actually denature things and, and um, take away some of the nutrients. And you do, you lose some of the nutrients when you cook meat. And so this is why a lot of people are actually going to more of a raw carnivore diet. And they, they think that, you know, makes them feel a lot better. I think that we've been cooking meat for about 800,000 years. So I think we're fully adapted to eating cooked meat. Um, but it's, that's neither here nor there. The point is you can eat raw meat and get everything you need. You can't do that with plants. Right. And I've tried to eat raw meat and it's, it's a little rough. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how far I'll go into that, but I did try it, especially the raw organs. That's, mm. I don't know if you eat organs, but I eat kidney, heart, and liver every single day. And mm. I tried that raw. And that's rough. Like it was yeah. kind of late, later in the day and I forgot to cook them. I was like, oh shoot, I just need to get it. In. I don't feel like cooking it. So I just took my tub where I ate it raw. And, whew, like I, yes. I, I'd have a hard time doing that every single day. And I've, I've taken, I've taken just a pound of ground beef, open up the package, put it on my plate, start forking mm. it, put it in my mouth. And it's pretty crazy, but I, I, I could see adapting to it. And if I was in a pinch, I could do it here and there. But it's it's not easy. I, I don't know how some people yeah. do that. Again. I've done it. Um, I think I think it's, there's a big mental barrier as well. Mm-hmm. You're meeting raw. Is this yeah. what you're going to get bacteria? You're going to get sick. I I did that with steak a few times actually. And uh, when I was when I first got down to Australia, I was in an Airbnb and like the stove didn't work. And I was like, well, this is bullshit. <laughs> so I had this I had this big slab of of ribeye. I get a big ribeye loin. I'm like, okay, well, what the hell am I going to do with this? And so I just started cutting up a, a couple of steaks off. I just cut it up into cubes, salted them all, sort of mixed them around, let them sit, let the salt soak in for like an afternoon. And I just started just eating these cubes uh, raw. Actually tasted great. And uh, especially with that bit of salt and letting it soak, right. actually tasted really, really good. Um, I don't do that as a matter of course, but you know, sometimes I'll be you know, having like my steak sort of salted and drying in the in the fridge. And I'll just be like hungry. I'll come back. I'm just like waiting for the pan to heat up. I'm just looking at this thing, looking at this thing. I'm like, God damn, that looks good. I'm like, okay, screw it. And I just take a bite out of it. I'm like, that actually tastes delicious. And I like eat half the steak just yeah. raw like that. But it's a bit more dried out. It's a bit right. easier to chew. Uh, I think the flavor is a bit better and more concentrated. And um, I don't really eat organs almost at all. I, th- I think I've had liver probably three times in the last decade. And uh, but those times that I've had it, um, I tried it raw and do the salting thing and let it sort of dry out a bit. So it doesn't have that slimy texture after a couple of days. It actually gets a little gummy and tacky. Mm-hmm. Actually, as a, like after like three, four days, if you cut it sort of thinner strips, it gets the consistency of like gummy candy, which I actually really like. I like gummy candies. Um, not that I've eaten them in a decade, but like, uh, but that was uh nostalgic to me and i was just like oh that's actually and it was like meat gummy candy i'm like this is actually amazing the best best liver i've ever had was that sort of raw and dried out for a couple of days I, I certainly better than any any uh cooked liver i've ever had um and it tastes good but you know, I had like a couple bites of that and i was like wow that tasted good I have another bite another bite and i'm like pretty good with that i think that as far as organs go you shouldn't have to force yourself you know it's mm-hmm. With, with eating meat, you know, if it doesn't taste good, that means your body doesn't want those nutrients. You're getting a negative feedback and that you should be getting a positive feedback and, and you will at first. And so I was getting positive feedback for that liver at first. And I sort of had one, I'm like, eh, I'm not really enjoying that as much. My body's just like, we have enough of this. And so, and I think that um, that's, that's something to think about as well is that, you know, in the wild, when we're hunting, you're getting one animal with one set of organs, right? Mm-hmm. So you take down a buffalo, it's got, you know, two years of, uh, of meat on it for you to eat. It's got one liver. It's got one. And so you can eat these things. And I, I think they are great in that they are very nutrient dense, but um, they are nutrient dense. And, and that can be the problem because you can get, you can get too much of a good. So it's kind of maybe too redundant. You don't need them as much as we think. I don't think you do. I, I don't think, and, and if you're eating like a, a mixed diet where you're going to be a bit more nutrient deficient, organs are your best friend, right? Mm-hmm. 
But if you're if you're already eating a carnivore diet, I think you get everything you need from muscle meat and fat. This is what you know. The Inuits don't eat organs; they they give those to their dog, and um, and so there's a lot of you know places that do eat organs, and a lot of places that don't eat organs. So I, I don't think it's necessary to eat organs. Um, and uh, if you're coming from a nutrition nutritionally deficient state, then like yeah, sure, you know, liver liver is a great idea. Um, but I think you should keep always keep it in proportion of the animal, right? Mm-hmm. Down in Buffalo, you're going to have hundreds of pounds of muscle meat and fat to every one pound of liver, you know, mm-hmm. probably treat that accordingly. So, you know, having a bit of liver every day or every week is fine to an extent, but it, 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 it can get too much, uh, pretty quickly, I think. And, and I think you run the risk of just getting things a little out of balance. And, um, you know, like there's, you know, the, and you would don't eat organs because there's so much vitamin a in the livers of marine mammals uh predators like seals and especially polar bear oh, that you can't you, eat polar bear liver <laughs> yeah well yeah you can die from the mm-hmm. a in it so there's more vitamin a in liver obviously a cow is gonna have much much less than seals or a polar bear but if you're just eating just you know just a ton of of cow liver maybe you're not going to get like toxic doses to the point that you're you're going to die or something but it can it can become too much and it can throw you off. And one of the it's things making your body work harder than it has to. Yeah. And, and, and that's why well, vitamins are hard for your body to clear. Right. It can actually take a very long time for your body to, to, to get rid of these things. Cause you can have long lasting effects. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that a lot of people who do eat a lot of organs have run into, these are the same guys who are saying, well, you're having thyroid problems. You're having hormonal problems. One of the problems with, with hypervitaminosis A, so too much vitamin A, is that it actually suppresses your thyroid stimulating hormone. So it can suppress your body's stimulus to secrete more thyroid hormone. So your thyroid function is going to go down. So that's, that's one of the problems that they're seeing. And they're, and they're saying, well, this is probably because of long-term ketosis. It's like, is it though? You know, my thyroid's fine. You know, and I've I've been doing this quite a long time, and and the other natural populations that don't eat any carbs are just eating meat and fat. You know, they don't seem to have these these problems either. You know, so I think that there's something else. There's there's something more going on there than just than just being in, in uh, you know, on a ketogenic diet for a long time. You know, because I mean we we're, we're designed to be like that. You know, like sixty six percent of animals just eat meat. They don't eat a combination of meat and carbs. I mean, literally, I mean, what animal on earth does that? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, there's, there's none, you know, like, and so, you know, it's, um, I don't think that that applies to us either. Uh, And you look at these indigenous populations, um, they'll eat mixed diets because mostly because they're, they've been, you know, uh, taken off their own land. They don't have the hunting grounds that they normally did. They're put on like reservations. And so they gotta, they gotta do what they have to do to survive. But if you look at how they live traditionally and what people were doing 50,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago, it was really just meat, you know, and, you know, what, what fruit and, and carbs and honey were available during the ice ages, not much, you know? And so I don't think, I don't think we need it. You know, we're, we're fully adapted uh, to just eat meat. So moral of the story, it's like you can get literally every nutrient you need in steak and mm-hmm. organs just have what's in the steak, but more of them. So we don't necessarily. Yeah. Need them. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, look, if you are deficient for whatever reason, because I think meat is what we're supposed to eat, but I mean, the meat that we're eating now is not, you know, a, a wild, you know, boar, you know, mm-hmm. years ago eating its own natural sort of food, um, you know, or, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, cows and mammoths and things like that. So, you know, the soil is a bit more deplete because of, you know, monocrop agriculture, you know, just destroying the land and, and uh, you know, getting rid of all the topsoil and, and nutrients out of the, out of the crown. But, um, you know, so it's, you know, we're not drinking, you know, Creek water and, and all that sort of stuff. And so we're, you know, it's not, it's not perfect, you know, but it's, it's, it's as close to, you know, what we were doing before, uh, as we, as we can sort of get realistically for most people, but, you know, some people might metabolize things a little bit differently. Maybe some people are, might have, you know, deficiency in something or other. So maybe, maybe a little more liver are good for them. Maybe a little more heart is good for them. And so, you know, that's fine, you know, but I don't, I don't think everyone needs, I don't, and I, and I still think that you should stick with the proportionality of, uh, 
of, of the organs with the fat so or, or with the body uh you know fat and muscle so you know if you're going to have liver you know having liver you know a bit of it once a week once every couple of weeks you know mm -hmm. that's fine and if you're having a bit of a deficiency maybe maybe increase that up a bit you know one thing that people talk about is like you know folate there's isn't a, there's a lot of folate in liver not as much in skeletal muscle meat fat so it's like okay well maybe maybe have some more liver I don't have a folate deficiency. I don't see folate deficiencies in my patients. I've had hundreds of patients uh, do a carnivore diet now. We check their bloods. Folates have been fine. I have I've met two people who have had sort of low folate on on a carnivore diet, but they feel fine. They don't have any symptoms. It could be that, well, it is the fact the case that that these sorts of ranges are probably probably need to be readjusted and refactored for people on a carnivore diet. However, since we have those refigured, readjusted numbers, we should probably just, you know, uh, get enough folate, you know, especially when you're talking about you know, like a, a fertile woman who, who wants to have babies, this can cause neural tube defects um, uh, in your baby, uh, having not enough folate. So I think that's, you know, make sure that you have enough. So for those people, yeah, have, have maybe you need more liver, you know, and get that folate up. Um, but my folate is perfect. And, and a lot of other people's folate is perfect too. So if you're in that category where you have a bit of a deficiency, you know, maybe, maybe up, up the liver a bit more, up these organs a bit more. That I think that's a great idea to do that, but I, it's necessary for everyone. Right. What's crazy is that like so many people, they eat a bunch of processed foods, junk foods, eating a bunch of vegetables, and the body is still able to survive and live. It blows mm -hmm. me away, like how badly people treat their bodies and it still goes so obviously the body is very resilient. It can handle a lot, mm -hmm. but how often realistically do you think we can handle and get away with it having plant foods? Like how often, like maybe yeah. once a week, like someone like you and me, we're very carnivore adapted. We've been doing this for a long time. If you're like of perfect health, like you and I are, how often can we get away with adding some plant foods to our diet? Because a lot of people they see how we eat and there's like, there's no way I could do that. There's no way I could stick to that. I need more variety. So for a person like that, how often do you think it would be okay for them to add some plants in their diet? Well, it, it would depend on what they're eating. And, um, and, and I think the trick is as well is to eat as small amount as you can and to change it up because the different plants have different defense chemicals and different families of plants will have different classes of defense chemicals. And so we do have some ability to detoxify these things, some better than others. We don't have much ability to detoxify like oxalates, for example, you just have to excrete those. And, um, and so there are other examples of that, but, you know, the, the problem is, is that we sort of eat the same things, you know? So people will eat, oh, I'll eat spinach, spinach is good for me. Kale is good for me. I'll eat just spinach and kale, spinach and kale, spinach and kale. So you're getting a buildup of all the toxins that are, in spinach and kale. Okay, we'll eat a little bit of spinach and kale, but that's what I eat is spinach and kale. It's going to build up and you're going to have more of a problem from that buildup. Whereas if you have a little bit of spinach and kale, then you maybe have some, you know, some lettuce or some carrots or some broccoli or whatever, and you, you switch it up and you change it or change between families and classes of plants, they're going to have different fence chemicals and you'll be able to sort of cycle through all these a bit better. So I think that for me, no plants are really worth it for me because I feel so much better without them. And I, I really like feeling optimal. I like having optimal health. So just having a bit of a different taste is not really worth it to me. It's like salad, like, wow, well, I, I don't want salad. <laughs> you know, I don't, I've never wanted salad, maybe salad with like a tasty fatty salad dressing. That could be good. You know, but the salad itself, I mean, I, I don't want to just chew on leaves. That's just never interested me. Mm -hmm. The the detriments from that, however subtle, are not worth it to me because I do notice a difference and I do like how I feel all the time without that. So for people who aren't quite there yet, you have to meet people where they are and they just look like, I, I just can't go full board into that. Maybe I can start eating more meat or whatever. Um, what could I, what do I, should I really avoid? I usually tell them, okay, well, first of all, just focus on like meat and eggs and just make that the main part of your meal and then get rid of 
alcohol, carbohydrates, and sugar and sweeteners, all description. Those are the main ones to get rid of. And then get rid of all nightshades. So like potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, all capsicums, all peppers. Get rid of all those things. Get rid of seeds and nuts and beans and, and those sorts of things. And then what's left over, just vary it. You know, just mix it up and just don't have the same thing every single day. And if you do that, you'll mitigate the damage being caused by these plants significantly. And you'll be providing yourself with a lot of the essential nutrients that you need that are going to keep you very, very healthy. So I think in, in, if you can't go all the way like you and I have, that's that's a good place to start. Mm-hmm. I agree. This is something that comes up a lot when I'm talking to a lot of males and I have a lot of arguments with this. A lot of males because of their poor diet, because of their poor lifestyle choices, because all that like household products and chemicals that they're around that they're not aware of, their testosterone gets super low. And then the doctor puts them on testosterone replacement therapy. And a lot of these dudes think like once they are on that testosterone replacement therapy, they're going to be on the rest of their life. And that's what doctors tell them that they are going to be having to have for the rest of their life. And I'm telling people, I have had clients personally that I have worked with them. I have got them on a nose to tail carnivore diet. And they were able to get off their TRT within months and never have to go on it again, ever again. And people think I'm crazy and like, where's the proof? Like, show me the numbers. There's no way that's possible. But I've seen it multiple times over and over. I had one client, he went from 195 testosterone to about 860 something within about eight or nine weeks. And that does sound absolutely crazy and bonkers and it doesn't (laughs) sound believable, but it it happened. And I have been seeing this over and over again. So- is that in fact, maybe maybe not for everyone is true, but do you think for a m- majority of men, do you think that's true that they do not have to be on tier two for the rest of life? They can correct it with a correct carnivore diet. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I work in, in metabolic health and functional medicine and, and uh, you know, we do uh, hormone replacement therapy for some people in certain circumstances, um, you know, like, you know, menopause, you know, uh, going through, uh, you know, and going on HRT, some people, uh, patients on TRT as well. Um, and, uh, but very select, you know, it's, it's, it's very select, uh, sort of patient sampling that, that we would do that for. And I always want them to go on uh, a carnivore diet first. So if there's something I can, I can get on a carnivore diet and do that, uh, we, I would generally see, uh, them increase a, a very, very, and this is not even averages. This is just very typical baseline, uh, will, will increase their testosterone by 30 to 40% minimum within the first sort of two to three months. And then we have examples like, like yours were like increased by six fold. I've seen that. I saw, I saw a guy, um, he, uh, he was in his sixties and he went from, from, you know, nearly you know, very low testosterone level, um, as your gentleman, uh, had, and it went up to, uh, basically testosterone testosterone levels of what you'd see in, in a healthy virile 25 year old right and this dude's in the 60s mm-hmm. just, just feel amazing i just have all this energy like all i want to do is is lift weights and you know have sex with my wife like, just like i'm just like a teenager again it was it was very funny he was so happy you know <laughs> he's just i just feel amazing this is awesome and um you know, so it's, uh, you, you see very dramatic results with that. And you know, I've had patients that when I came into this practice, they'd been on testosterone replacement for years and years and years and years and years. You get them on a carnivore diet. I've absolutely had patients able to come off of their TRT. The thing is, the thing is that TRT on, on TRT doesn't stop your ability to, to make testosterone later. There can be a lag effect, like, you know, if like, like, uh, you know, bodybuilders doing like a cycle of steroids or something like that, you know, maybe have to take, you know, different sorts of medications to, to get their, you know, testicles working again and, and creating testosterone and stimulating them again. But with or without that, your body will start making it again. And in fact, it's, it's actually more likely that you, you've given your, that organ a chance to rest and is actually more capable of, of making testosterone afterwards. Again, you know, think of it as, as like your, your pancreas, you're making all this insulin, you're making more and more insulin, more and more insulin, and you sort of get burnt out from making so much insulin uh, and, and type two diabetics can become insulin uh, dependent. But when you go on a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, you start making much less insulin 
and your body starts healing and repairing and and actually when you, if you start eating carbohydrates again first there's a bit of a lag period because you know it's not used to making as much insulin and so it doesn't pre-make insulin doesn't preload insulin to get that initial hit but after a couple of days it will start doing that again and in fact then you're more insulin sensitive and you have a better insulin response and so your body's actually better able to produce and use insulin at that point because you've rested it right and so the same thing can be true of uh, testosterone production in men as well and so uh, getting somebody on a proper hormonal diet, which is, you know, part of part of the whole program, um, can get them producing their own testosterone much more, and can get them off TRT. And then once they're off TRT, their their body can start making a lot more testosterone as well. So um, it's not, I don't think that at all that it's um, you know the end of the road that you just you go on TRT and that's it for the rest of your life. Well, you know, it's probably the case for people that, you know, they, they got to that point where their testosterone is going down, down, down. And if they don't change their ways, they don't change what they're doing. They're not going to change their results, right? You do the same thing. You're going to get the same results. Mm -hmm. And so if they just continue doing what they're doing, yeah, they, they probably can never come off TRT if they want certain levels of testosterone. However, if they radically change their, their diet and lifestyle that, that will significantly affect their testosterone. And so that's different. You change uh, what you're doing, you'll change your outcomes as well. And, and that's certainly what I've seen in practice as well. And do you think like there still are outliers of men that no matter what, even though they're doing a clean carnivore diet, they still will have to be on testosterone replacement therapy the rest of their life? Do you think there still are those guys? I mean, you can, you can, you can be damaged. I mean, you can, you can permanently, I mean, there are people that just have accidents and, you know, they have TRT because they've, they've damaged that organ. Um, or, you know, you have a pituitary tumor and you damage your pituitary and you have to be on those hormones the rest of your life as well. Um, outside of that, not many, you know, not many examples. Um, you know, you get to a certain age, you're, you're, you're just, you're not 25 anymore, you know, and you're not going to be making hormones to the extent that you were as a healthy 25 year old, but you'll be making a lot more than you would have otherwise. And I think that, I mean, there's always the exception to any rule and I'm sure there's examples out there where they go on a perfect carnivore diet and their testosterone doesn't change, but I'd be, I'd be, I'd want to see them. I'd want to vlog it, you know, because it'd be very, very outside the norm. And, um, I would be very skeptical that we're actually doing it uh, perfectly right. I, I do think that because there's so many factors that go into this, mm -hmm. that, that all, all improve on a carnivore diet. you just, you have more cholesterol, you can make more testosterone. You're not having Carbohydrates and insulin block, you know, the conversion and balance of, of your testosterone, and your estrogen. You're not having all these phytoestrogens and hormone disruptors from plants disrupting your 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 biological um, uh, production and utilization of uh, testosterone and estrogen. You have more carnitine from eating meat and red meat. So you'll have more testosterone receptors. You have more of a testosterone response with the same amount of testosterone. And, uh, you know, the list goes on. I mean, there's so many different effects. I mean, the idea that someone who has working testes not having a benefit from this is very unlikely. Mm -hmm. This is the problem is too many guys think they are that exception or they think they are that outlier. They're just too stubborn to actually change their diet and do it consistently for a long period of time. I think that's all that's going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that like, you know, how do you, how do you know, you know, unless you try it, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Right. So you have to eat it and, and try it, see it. Mm -hmm. as it and so, you know, going for a month, going for two months, three months, I mean, that's not enough. The scheme of things in, in, in the course of your entire life. Like, I mean, how, what is that? That's nothing. You know, I mean, I blinked and this year was over. You know, it's like two, three months is nothing, especially if it's something that can such, so dramatically improve your health and, uh, and how you feel. And so uh, I think just try it. You know, I mean, even after a month, you're going to feel so much better you know, and, um, and then you sort of keep going it, keep doing it. And then you check your, your hormones after, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, three months, it, they will be better. You know, you will have improvement and, and all your other parameters will improve as well, uh, from what I've seen. And, um, you know, there aren't really any exceptions to that, that I've seen personally. Mm -hmm. And then for the people that think like, I mean, are we running off of fat as our fuel or running off of carbohydrates, glucose as our fuel? Yeah. Um, I want to clarify that we are running off of fat as fuel all the time. 
and we do have that temporary insulin spike, blood sugar spike, and then it goes back down. So how, how can you make it super simple for people to understand that we are running off of fat as fuel all yeah. the time? And we just have those well, moments, moments. Yeah. Well, I mean, fat is our gas tank, right? So you, that, that's where you store energy to use later, right? So glycogen is, is, is a very poor, very poor man's fat. So you can carbo load and do all that and store all this glycogen in your liver, but there's a limit to that. And after a couple hours of, of heavy, intensive exercise, you'll run out of that glycogen, you'll hit the wall and you'll, you'll, you know, crash out. But that's only if your insulin is up and you're not able to uh, access your fat stores because insulin blocks lipolysis. So it blocks a breakdown of your fat to then turn into energy, to go through gluconeogenesis, to turn into uh, uh, carbohydrates and glucose and, and glycogen. So it's only when you're eating carbohydrates and your insulin goes up that you lose the ability to access your gas tank. So that's like filling up your car and then sticking a plug in between the gas tank and your engine and just saying, oh, no, I'm just going to pour in gas as I go. This is, this is just a much better way. That, that's only if I get lost mm -hmm. in the woods and, and then desert and I, just, I can't eat for three weeks. That's what that's what, and that's, that's what's taught in biology. That's what's taught in biochemistry that, you know, this is when you get lost out in the desert and you're in a famine, then you can run on your fast stores. But otherwise, you just run on on glucose. That's that's uh, insane. I mean, the only reason we say that is because by the time we we're able to look at our biochemistry uh, to a molecular state, everyone was eating carbohydrates. So we thought, oh, this is this is what it looks like when you eat, and this is when you're when you're starved and you're not eating after 24 hours. This is what it looks like. Failing to recognize that when you eat anything at all except carbohydrates, it also looks like your so-called fasting. So when I eat 5,000 calories in ribeye. Like I'm not fasting. I'm clearly not fasting. That's, so that's not a fasting metabolism. It can't be, right? That is, that's, I think, our primary metabolic state. That's a primary metabolic state of nearly all animals in the wild because they're all running on fat and protein, right? Cows as well as, as lions. And so we're the same way. And we even have studies with wolves back in 1981 because they were saying, well, you need to eat carbs to burn carbs, Right. And so do, you know, and, and, and wolves don't carbo low before they chase caribou for 10 hours. You know, do they have blood sugar? Do they have glycogen? They found out, yes, they do. And it's rock solid. It doesn't change because they're constantly replenishing it no matter what they're doing. It's just constantly, constantly replenishing it from their fat stores. And so, you know, it doesn't matter how slim you are, unless you're completely emaciated and, and on the verge of dying from starvation, you will have days, if not weeks of uh, fat stores available to, you know, to run and to, uh, you know, compete in any sort of athletic endeavor for, you know, as long as you want, you know, because you'll have two hours of glycogen, even if you carbo load, but you'll literally have weeks of fat available. So mm -hmm. as far as an athlete's concerned, that's what you want. You want to be running on your fat because there've been studies with, uh, uh, from, from professor Tim Noakes, looking and showing that people in a ketogenic state or a carb driven state, you actually get the same athletic output. You can still push yourself and drive yourself and do all the same sorts of things, right? Except that the guys that are keto adapted, that are just running on their fat because they don't have this insulin spike, they can just keep going. They never hit the wall. They just keep going, going, going. Whereas the guys on uh, guys and girls on um, uh, a carbohydrate, insul high insulin sort of state, They'll run out. They'll run out of their glycogen. They'll hit the wall and they'll have to stop. You know, so it, there's a massive, massive advantage to not eating carbohydrates for an athletic uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. And then I've heard some people say that running off of fat as fuel, engaging those ketones in your blood, that's like a they say like that's the last resort of your body getting that fuel source through ketones versus just having carbohydrates and you're just having that instant insulin all the time. And people, they, they do say that running off of ketones is that last resort and it's not good for you. It's better for you to be running off that quick insulin. So how is that not true? Well, I, I mean, how is it true? I mean, what, what's their basis for saying that? You know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it's a, it's, it's just a, it's, it's just a, a guess is what this is what they're doing, but they're assuming a fact that's not in evidence. They say, well, since, you know, our body wants to run on glucose and ketones are a last resort. Well, who says that it is? That's not necessarily the case. That's probably derived from the idea that, you know, in a fed state, you're running on, on glucose. And then if you don't eat for 24 hours, you go into this state where you're, 
you're running on ketones, but you're not running on ketones. You're running on ketones, blood sugar, liver glycogen, muscle glycogen. You're making all of these things and you can, you, you can mobilize and, and restore these things all the time. Your blood sugar stays here. It doesn't, it doesn't go down, right? It doesn't go up either. It just stays here. And so does your glycogen level. So even if you're, you're working, you're going, you're going, you're going, you're going, your glycogen stays here because you're constantly replenishing it. So you're using it and replenishing it at the same time from your fat stores. So, you know, people are just saying, oh, well, you, you, you want to run on glucose. That's what you normally run on because they're saying this is your fed state. So that's your normal state. That's your body wants to do wrong. Your body doesn't want to do that. Your body preferentially uh, you know, runs on combination of, of, of energy uh, that, that they supply from their fat stores. And this is what animals in the wild do. This is what we, as long as we're not eating carbohydrates. So that's why I think that that's not our primary metabolic state. Well, I think that the so-called fasting state is our primary metabolic state. That's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. People saying, well, we, we want to run on glucose and glycogen. It's like, okay, you make glucose and glycogen. You, you don't run out of this stuff. That's, that's the thing that people don't get. When you eat carbohydrates, you will run out of carbohydrates mm -hmm. because you're not able to replenish them. When you don't eat carbohydrates, you have unlimited carbohydrates because you make carbohydrates constantly but you also have ketones, which is actually your brain's preferred uh, energy source and your heart's preferred energy source. Your brain will always run on ketones no matter what you do. There's always some ketones available. It will always run on some ketones. I learned that 23 years ago in biochemistry. And then when you switch over to so-called fasting state, it's almost exclusively running on ketones. There are certain areas of your brain that still will have a bit of glucose use, but the vast majority will predominantly run on ketones. But it's not just being in a ketogenic state. It's just when your ketones are above a certain threshold. When you have enough ketones to run your brain, it doesn't matter how high your glucose is. Your, your brain will shut that out and just run on the ketones. Okay, So that means it prefers ketones because they're more abundant glucose. But when there's enough ketones, it only runs on ketones. It will always run on ketones. Whatever ketones are available, it will run on ketones and it will fill in the gaps with glucose. And as soon as there's enough ketones, it doesn't use any glucose. So that means that it prefers ketones. It does. And your brains are also made out of ketones. Ketones cross the brain barrier and reconstitute into fatty acids, which then build the physical structures of your brain, as well as fueling them and giving the energy supply for them. Gotcha. So for people like women, for example, women, their hormones are a lot more complicated than men's. And when a woman has been doing the carnivore diet pretty correctly for over a year or two, and they're still not losing weight, what do you think is going on there? And how do you rectify that and allow them to lose weight? Because, I mean, your body doesn't want to lose weight, because fat, because fat is our fuel source. Mm -hmm. We hold on to it for survival and we always have ancestrally. So like, how do you, I guess, how do you fix that? Like, What's going on? What is not allowing their body to lose weight, even though they've been trying for so long? Yeah, you have to you have to sort of um, dig a little deeper at, at that point, you know, because some people will say, "Yeah, I'm doing a carnivore diet. I'm just eating meat, all these sorts of things." But then you're like digging, okay, what exactly are you eating? Oh, oh just just meat and water. So, okay, so you're using any seasonings or spices? Well, I, you know, I drink coffee. I use monk fruit sweetener, some stevia, and doing that. So it's like, okay, so right there, there's more things going on there, right? So a lot of people when they when they have difficulty with weight loss, specifically with weight loss they're almost always using some sort of sweetener, almost always. And, um, and something like stevia or monk fruit sweetener, or some sort of artificial sweetener. That's not a good idea. That can, that can actually trigger insulin, insulin. And that goes up that you can think about it in layman's terms that puts you into a fat storage metabolism, as opposed to a fat burning and uh, mobilizing metabolism. And so any sort of artificial sweetener can do that. Uh, there are studies showing that. There are other studies showing that it doesn't have as much effect. I see this happen in in real life, and so that's sort of where you know uh, my I'm favoring uh, you know uh, the the data on that because there you know that's that is what what it shows and what I see. So in any case, most of these people will be doing something that's not just meat and water, mm -hmm. um, and so almost always it's like monk fruit sweet. And I talk to people, they, they say, Oh, it reversed my autoimmune issues. That's so much better health. I'm off my medications, but I wasn't losing weight. I'm just, oh, I, I guess, you know, just carnivore just doesn't work for me. I'm just one of those people. No, no carnivore works for everyone because we are carnivores biologically. There aren't like some people are carnivores and some aren't carnivores. That's not how biology works. Mm -hmm. if, if 
one person is a carnivore and another person is a, is an herbivore or an omnivore, you're two, you're talking about two different species and we're not two different species. That can't be the case. So, you know, we do have an optimal diet. I, I argue that that's a carnivore diet, but it is something, there is something that's universal to everyone to be the best thing biologically for our species. Just like there's something that's biologically most appropriate for a lion or a giraffe or a zebra, right? Something is optimal for all members of that species or else they're not of the same species. That is a, that is a hard rule and law. Mm -hmm. And so People generally, you know, so they're saying there's like, I've, I've reversed all these diseases, all these issues have come off this medication, but I didn't lose weight. Therefore, it didn't work for me. To me, that sounds like a resounding success. You had an amazing, so you, you came off all these medications, you reversed diseases that, that, that as of two years ago, all doctors on earth would say, that's not possible. You cannot reverse those things. They don't go away, you know? And so yeah, I think that's, a, that's an amazing success that these people have had. As far as losing weight, some people get stuck on the scale, not realizing that you can lose fat and put on muscle and increase bone density and not lose weight. And in fact, you might gain weight, you know, so it's about body composition rather than just weight. Also, there are people that have really screwed up their hormones and uh, especially things like leptin. Leptin is a satiety signal. It's secreted from your fat tissue, goes to your brain, tells you that you don't need to eat anymore. We have a lot of energy. We're satiated. We're satiated. We, we can just stop. And um, people can get leptin insensitivity and they can get very high leptin levels and their body's just not able to recognize it as well. And so it can take time. It can take months. It can take years for that to come down and to normalize and their bodies to actually recognize these signals better and to, and to, to, then get into a state where they can, uh, oh. you know, start losing weight. Um, you know, it is, it is said amongst bariatric, uh, medicine doctors, bariatric surgeons, your weight loss doctors and surgeons, that if your leptin is above a hundred, it's normally between like six and eight, that's what it's supposed to be. And, um, if it's above 100, you will not be able to lose weight with diet and starving. You, you will not lose weight. You will have to get surgery. Uh, and yet I've seen people with leptins of 200 go on a carnivore diet and have that start coming down and start losing weight, you know, so it can happen. Um, you just need to do the right thing. There are people like Kelly Hogan who, uh, you know, for six months didn't, didn't lose weight. In fact, gained weight. And she was just like, you know, people saying it was probably bone density muscle. And she's like, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I was, I was putting on fat, but her health issues were so much better. She was just like, well, look, I feel, I feel better than I ever have. I'm just going to trust the process and just see how it goes. After about six months, and things healed up and her hormones got into a state where they were satisfied with what was going on and her metabolism started to rise and she started losing weight. Another thing is too, is that people have after years and years and years of starvation diets and eating horrible things and having a very unhealthy relationship with food, they can completely box their metabolism. So their hormones are, are completely you know, macerated and their, and their metabolism is suppressed significantly. So it can take a long time to undo that. You know, the, the, there's this show, I've mentioned this before, but there's a show, The Biggest Loser, years ago, where they had these people uh, get these professional, you know, celebrity trainers and just working at the gym all the time, just eating, you know, just some some rabbit pellets and, and just starving themselves, basically. And they lost weight. And so it had all these people lose lose weight. But they checked their metabolism. Their metabolic rate was was just was almost non-existent. They had, they had completely suppressed their metabolism. Because when you're starving, you're telling your body you're starving and you have a famine and you don't, you don't have to eat because no animal doesn't eat if it has access to food. They don't just go be like, you know what, I'm just gonna, not going to eat this week. You know, like they have access to food. They eat it. If they're hungry, they eat it. And so that's giving your body a signal that you don't have access to food, that you're in a famine. And so it goes, right, well, we need to conserve energy. We need to slow down the metabolism. We need to store fat. We're not going to release this fat. And so the biggest losers, they lost fat because they just starved themselves and their metabolism shot as a result of it. So that wasn't a healthy way to lose weight. Six years after that show, they checked their metabolism again. It had not recovered in those. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, presumably some of those people had, had continued on with the same sort of diet and lifestyle that they'd learned then. But, um, you know, I, I don't know that every, all of them did, uh, in any case, that's 
you know, when you go back, you start eating anything else besides that really restrictive way of eating, you know, because your metabolism is so low and it wants to store fat because it thinks you're, you're on the verge of death, you know, you're going to, you're just going to slam on fat. So people that have come from that sort of background with a lot of restrictive eating have really damaged their bodies and metabolism. They're just, they're just going to take a bit longer than other people uh, to, to get their body into a state that it trusts they're not in a famine and to start increasing the metabolism metabolic rate, to then start using more of the fat tissue. But I think that that's a big problem that people have because they still restrict, they still try to fast and restrict on a carnivore diet. And they're still triggering that suppression of their metabolism. Whereas seemingly paradoxically, when they actually eat until they're satiated and satisfied, that signals the body that, hey, we don't need to sequester all this. We can increase the metabolism and they actually lose weight. So, you know, I was trying to, you know, lose weight when I got back from Bangladesh doing humanitarian work there. And I was trying to get back into shape for rugby. And so I was eating basically rabbit food, you know, just I was not eating carbs. I was on a ketogenic diet sort of thing, but I wasn't doing keto. I just wasn't eating carbs. And I was just eating like a lot of vegetables, like a lot of greens, um, you know, so uh, spinach, kale, and broccoli, and then just a little bit of meat and with not much fat on it. And so I wasn't eating much calories and I wasn't losing weight and I was just not feeling great. And so my weight was fluctuating with the amount of water weight and things like that. And I then said like, no, actually humans are carnivores. It's the kind of animal we are. We need to, I just get rid of all the stuff, you know, and, uh, and just eat meat. And I just started eating a lot more meat. It, and started eating a lot, a lot more meat than uh, I was eating before. A lot of fatty meat. I just stopped eating the vegetables, and I lost twenty three pounds in ten days. It just dropped off me, right? But then after that, you know, eating more calories, right? I, I probably quintupled the amount of calories I was eating, and all of a sudden, my wife's like, "Yep, yeah, we're good now." <laughs> you know, you know, weight started just dropping off me. After that, I stayed the exact same weight, but my body composition just transformed. So like I was just stacking on muscle and shredding fat, but I stayed the exact same weight. And because I was, I was losing a lot of fat, but I was increasing my muscle mass and my bone density. And so it offset. And so people need to recognize that as well, that it's not about losing weight. It's about losing fat and gaining muscle and gaining bone density. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to achieve here. So there's a lot of carnivore groups, long-term carnivore groups, like 15, 20 year carnivores that are running these things. And the groups have been around for nearly that long. You know, they always talk about, you know, we don't want to talk about scale success. We want to talk about, oh, hey, I lost weight. All this. That's not the goal. The goal is health. The goal is position. Not everyone's going to lose all the weight that they want. Not everyone's going to lose all the body fat that they want, especially as we get older. Um, we just have we're less elastic, you know, we, we've been damaging ourselves for a lot longer. So if someone comes to this in their seventies, you know, they may not get to the point that they would have if they started in their thirties, you know, because it's just, they damaged themselves for a lot longer, you know? So one way to look at it, uh, that, that someone sort of the analogy that someone said, um, that I liked was, you know, there's no shortcuts, right? You know, you spent years and years and years getting into the state that you are now, it's going to take time to get out of it. You walk 10 miles in the woods, you got to walk 10 miles back. You know, there's no shortcuts. You know? And so it doesn't go as long. You know, if you've been eating poorly for 50 years, it's not going to take 50 years to get out of that. Um, but it can take, it can take, uh, you know, a couple of years. It can take a few years depending on where you are. And so I think people need to look at, examine exactly what they're eating, make sure they're not eating anything except meat and water, absolutely no sweeteners whatsoever. Even spices and dairy uh, can cause, uh, uh, that's another one too. A lot of people have that have problems with stalls and the weight. They just, they're just eating just a load of dairy. And mm. for some reason that just, that causes a problem for some people, especially milk, you know, because it has carbohydrates in it. And so just getting down to just bare bones, meat and water, and then giving your body time, you know, because, and then getting a composition, body composition scan. Because you talk to a lot of people, I'm just not losing weight. I'm not losing weight. How are your clothes fitting? Well, actually, they are fitting looser, and I've had to like buy a new belt. What are you complaining about? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but people get so fixated on on the scale, and I think that's that's uh, that can be a distraction, right? So, fasting. Do you think 
because this is something I have a lot of my clients do is Mm long-term fasting and they're doing carnivore. Do you think that's harming them more than it's doing good? Because I'm talking like one 48 hour fast a week, a 72 hour fast a week, maybe a 96 to 120 hour fast a week. Sometimes a one 24 hour dry fast in the beginning of the week and then another one 24 hour dry fast at the end of the week. Do you think that is harming people or is it helping people lose weight quicker? Um, I, it, I think it depends on individuals. You know, if, if someone has had a you know unhealthy relationship with food and has, has eaten a lot more than they really have needed to for a long time, that you know fasting can can reset what their their relationship with food, right? Mm-hmm. Understanding that you don't have to eat three times a day, four times a day, five times a day. In fact, you don't actually have, have to eat every day. It's okay. Mm-hmm. You'll be all right, and you you'll feel okay. And maybe you'll want to eat, but it's just like, but hey, after a few days, you're like, actually, this is this is okay. I think that that's that that's pretty helpful. Um, but I think from a from a health and weight loss standpoint, yeah, maybe you'll lose weight faster by by fasting more often. Um, but I think you run you do run the risk of slowing down your metabolism, and I think that that a lot of people, most people, will just be able to eat intuitively. And be able to just lose a lot of weight and do it in a, in a healthy fashion. There may be that those, those people like the, you know, the, the woman you sort of had in your example hasn't really been losing weight. Let's say she was doing everything sort of perfect, actually just eating meat and water. And she was like in a Kelly Hogan sort of situation where her body just, just wasn't, it was just holding onto that fat and just not, not letting go. Um, and there wasn't like a body composition thing. Just one thing was replacing the other. You know, it might be that that you know you could try something else. I mean, you, you you can go and just let your body heal, and eventually things usually do come out the other end. Um, I don't know of any studies or any sort of data, one way or the other, to show that fasting would accelerate that. But if you're in a stall and you're you're not getting the results that you necessarily want, or maybe it's been going on for months and months and months, and you just hit a plateau. I think it's I think it's perfectly reasonable to try and change things up and try to change change things around. Maybe adding in a day of fasting, a couple of days of fasting, and just see what it does to your body. And if that helps, then you know you can go on with that. There, you know, Jake Wish loves fasting. You know, he's a big proponent of that. And um, you know, there can be advantages there. I think that you know, anytime you're restricting, though, you do run the risk of of slowing your metabolism. And but you know, I think people are very very capable of not eating every single day, you know, you know, Genghis Khan, the Mongol, uh, Mongol empire, they routinely, you know, would, would eat sort of, you know, once a week, you know, once or twice a week. And they go like five days, just, you know, warring up and down, uh, you know, the countryside and then, you know, wouldn't eat for five days. And then on the fifth day, they'd eat 10 pounds of horse meat and go do it again. You know? So I think we're, we're fully capable. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that as long as the on your other side of that, you're eating to, to satiation. Right. Uh, I don't think that you should combine fasting with restricted eating. I don't think you right. should. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, I, I definitely have them eat all their protein and food to satiation for the day before the fast starts and then coming off the fast, do it again. So it's always that food that they would have normally eaten without fasting. Yeah, I think I think that's 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 fine to do. and. Um, in certain circumstances, I don't think it's, I don't think you always have to do it. Mm-hmm. I always, I usually just try to say, just, just eat until you're satisfied when you're hungry. If you, you may not be hungry every day, you know, it may not be that you want to eat every day. You don't have to. Um, but when you eat, you should, you should eat until you're satisfied until meat stops tasting good. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is too, is that some people coming into this have had you know, disordered eating and, and, when you start restricting and fasting and doing these sorts of things that can, that can trigger those sorts of disordered eating. Whereas um, it's better for them just to be, Hey, you can eat whenever you're hungry. You can eat as much as you want. That's very helpful for them, especially people coming from, from eating disorders uh, because you, you don't want to get them back down the track of, of food is the enemy and you have to watch out for it. And, and so food is good. Food is really good. It keeps you alive. And so that's how you should treat food is this, this, this is a nutrient source that provides benefit to your life. And that's it. You know, it shouldn't be your entertainment. 
Right. It shouldn't be like you go out on the weekend to enjoy food. Like you should enjoy, always enjoy your food, but it's not, that's not the purpose of eating. The purpose of eating is, is just giving yourself nutrition, your body, what it needs. And so, you know, treating it like that, I think is very important, especially for people coming from uh, eating disorders. Mm -hmm. I agree. So with um, the runs, so the runs is an extremely normal thing when people initially go carnivore. Mm -hmm. But I'm confused because I've personally experienced this. Like I've been carnivore for like three years now and I still get the runs more often than it makes sense. I should. So what do you think is going on there? Um, there's usually, usually different things can happen. Um, do you drink coffee or do you use any sweeteners or anything like that? No, nope, no. Nope. Then almost certainly it's from eating just a, a lot more fat than your body can absorb. Mm. So, body has a, a specific ability to absorb that and, and that's it, right? So you make bile and that bile can emulsify fat. So it could be that when you get more fat adapted, your body starts saying, oh, okay, hey, look, we have more fat available. I'll make some more bile to absorb this stuff and, and you can do that and that's fine. But when you run out of bile and eventually you will run out of bile, you can't really absorb fat as well. You can absorb some, but it's, it's a very small percentage. The, mo the majority of it goes out. And I think that's what keeps stool soft is that that little excess fat um, sits in there and, and keeps it soft. So you don't need to be, you don't need fiber. You don't need more and more and more water. You want that to dry out in your colon. What your colon is for is to desiccate uh, your, your feces so that you conserve water, right? But it's always going to stay soft as long as there's fat in it. So if people get constipated, dry, hard stools, Obviously, you're going to go much less because you're absorbing much more food. You're not having to excrete as much waste. But if it's dry and hard, that's constipation. And that, I think, is from not eating enough fat. Because if you eat enough fat that you have a little, you absorb everything that your body wants, and then some, that little bit extra will, will keep that soft. So if you're constipated, then by definition, you're not eating enough fat because you're absorbing every ounce of fat that you're eating and your body will likely want more. But if you're eating a lot more fat than your body can absorb, it will just come out more loosely, right? This is, this is where the term, you know, uh, as quick as fat through a goose comes in because like, fat, you know, they don't have really much capacity to absorb enough, a lot of fat. So they eat a chunk of fat, just, they just poop it out pretty quickly. And so that happens with us as well. So wow. if, um, if you're having loose stools like that, it's most likely because you're just eating a lot more fat than your body can absorb. And it could be things like an infection or something that's irritating. You, you go out and you eat something that maybe is an optimal, maybe it has some seed oils or maybe it has some spices. Maybe that could upset your stomach and that can increase the motility of your intestines and that can cause a bit of a, you know, a upset stomach and loose stools. Um, but if everything else is, is, is fine, you don't have an infection, you're not having, introducing anything non-carnivore. Uh, then I would say that's that's almost certainly what's happening. And then you just okay. pull back a bit on the amount of fat that you're eating. But it's not bad for you, right? It's right. not dangerous. It's not causing an infection. It's not causing harm. It's just inconvenient, you know? And so when I get that, I mean, and sometimes that will happen. It's just like, oh, okay, I'm just, you know, I'll think back in the last few days. I'm like, yeah, I've, I've been having ribeyes with butter on them for the last four days. Maybe that, that was a bit more than I needed. And so maybe I don't have the butter for the next few days. It just, it just settles down. Wow. I've been wondering that for so long and it was just such a simple answer. <laughs> That's awesome. Just too much fat. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I could keep talking forever and ever because I have so many questions, but um, if you have to go, by all means, it's yeah. up to you. Um, I, I probably do have to go because I, ha I have an appointment after this, but uh, no yeah, we'll be we definitely do it again sometime. And uh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was a pleasure, man. It was good to talk to you. Good to, to finally meet you. We've been, you know, we've been talking online uh, for a while now, but that was great to finally get a chance to, to chat and um, where can people find you and uh, find yourself? Yeah. Uh, regenerative life fitness on Instagram um, and on TikTok, And then just Tyler LaMarche, LinkedIn, Tyler LaMarche on Facebook. And then my website is regenerative life fitness.com. Perfect. And uh, so thank you everyone uh, for listening. Uh, uh, people can like, and subscribe to, to, to all of our channels. That'd be great. And um and uh, hit the bell and subscribe and, and all that good stuff. And um, thank you very much, everyone. And I uh, appreciate your time and talk to you later. Heck yeah, see you.
Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys.